You didn't actually have to look for a job for the first year and a half you were unemployed. You didn't actually have to go look for a job for the first 18 months. Under the new bill, you got to start looking for a job from day one, which makes sense. The people I know who are laid off, and they're working from day one to get it. So everyone else in America needs to as well. Drug screening, we're going to allow for the first time in 40 years states to drug screen unemployment. One, because more and more industries require that you pass the drug test. And two, look, if you're not clean, chances of getting a good, good job, chances of being a good parent, pretty slim as well. So we're going to allow states, they don't have to, but they can. And my guess is Texas is going to be one of them. And then this state innovation, here's our problem. Uh, the way we do unemployment, we do it like we did it in the 1930s. We just send out checks. And that's the whole focus. Folks of unemployment ought to be helping you get a job, a good job, the sooner the better. So we, we're going to allow 10 states, Texas one of them, to be one of those innovators to show us how we can match local workers with local jobs quicker, sooner, better. And so we think that type of innovation at the state level will help us reform that whole program at the federal level. Medicare payments for physicians. Our problem is the way Washington reimburses our local doctors, if you've got any moms or dads or grandparents on Medicare, they'll tell you how hard it is to get a doctor who can see them. It's getting worse each day. And part of the big reason is the way Washington reimburses our local doctors is horrible. So we made a fix. It's going to help through the end of the year, but it's not the permanent solution that we ought to have. The other thing is no tax increases. They propose a whole bunch of tax increases uh, in this area, a lot of them on energy, a lot of them on com uh, companies like yours or customers that you serve. Big tax increases, which would have slowed drilling, we think, expiration by about 30% of America. So that's 30% of your potential business that could have been hurt. We block that. We paid for all the new government spending. We cut about $11 billion out of the president's health care. We closed this welfare loophole. This is hard to believe. Over the last few years, we've seen a disturbing number of people who are accessing the, their welfare benefits at strip clubs, casinos, and liquor stores. Now, what are the chances that money is going to actually get to their family and do any good? So we had to close that loophole, hard to believe. And finally, uh, new federal workers and members of Congress have to contribute more to the pension. They don't contribute the same amount as you. But we need to. We need to. So we made that change. Here's here's a big dispute. Uh, the big argument in Washington wasn't about whether we should extend the payroll tax uh, holiday for the rest of the year. It was should we pay for it because that money that comes out of your Social Security contributions comes directly out of Social Security, our retirement plan for seniors. And so here's the hole that we blown last year and this year in Social Security. You can tell, looking out ahead, Social Security, most, one of the most important programs for our seniors, is permanently in deficit, permanently in red ink. It never goes back to break even you know, if we don't change it. And so we just blew a big hole in it. Our argument, we lost the argument. Our argument is we ought to cut spending in Washington to fill that hole. We ought to make sure our seniors don't have to worry about where they get their checks. And last year, this country, our country, had to borrow $140 billion from China, Korea, and other countries just to pay Social Security. We didn't borrow that much money just to pay our seniors. That's wrong. And so we lost the argument. Hard to believe what we did, uh, and the president won it. But um, our argument is this can't continue. We can't keep on the whole Social Security. A highway bill, second issue. Um, we're struggling with this bill, even though it's got to some great reforms, no earmarks. The last uh, highway bill, what they do is they extend the way we pay for our highways in about five year increments, sometimes six, but normally five years at a time. Gives you a chance to sort of uh, like recertify uh, every five years in the highway. Uh, and the last one has 6,000 plus earmarks, this has zero. No increased gas taxes. We dedicate highway taxes for highway projects, which seems like a no brainer, but in the past, up to 30% of the money you and I pay at the gas pump that we send to Washington was being used for non highway projects, like daycare centers and railroad museums, even some nice things, hiking bike trails, which I love them. But when we're stuck on the interstate, you can't get your product out of here, and you can't get home to see your kids at the end of the day. Your highway dollars ought to go to highway projects. So 
We made that change. We eliminate 70 programs. We cut the time it takes to get these projects to the ground. Makes great sense. We're struggling with that bill right now. On the energy, we've done some good things to pay for this highway bill. We triple. If we get our way, my guess is the Senate's going to block us. But we would triple our offshore energy leases over the next 15 years. Triple the amount of production we do, which is good for you and good for your customers. We do. We require the federal government to start leasing more on federal lands for oil shale. We start to open up that tiny part of Alaska dedicated that was always dedicated for energy production, and we move the Keystone Pipe XL pipeline forward. Um, this is what we are trying to pass out of the house. I think these are pretty good. These make these are pretty common sense things. I don't want to raise gas taxes. I really think we should send our money from Texas to Washington. Have to beg to get it back. We ought to leave it here in Texas. But if we're going to do more roads and more highways, the best way to do it is not new taxes, new revenue, and energy production creates new revenue from here. And a lot of jobs, too, by the way. The only three states in all the country that have made back all their job losses from the recession, only two states have done it. Texas, North Dakota, and Alaska. What do those three have in common? Energy development. All three are energy states, all three are making use of them, and all three have bounced back from the recession better than any other state. This is the way our highway uh, uh, agency looks today, just a bureaucratic mess. This is the way we fix it. It's not completely what I'd like, but it's a start to streamline it. I guarantee you, if your company looked like that, your competitors would be beating you like a drum. We've got to streamline just like you streamline here today. This is how long it takes, 15 years it can take for a highway project to get in the ground. We cut it in half, and we think we have to do even better than that, because the longer you delay these projects, one, it costs more, two, long, you and I have seven traffic waiting for that project to get done. Um, more American-made energy is just key. We, we push hard in this bill to do that. The president just gave us his budget here two weeks ago. Uh, it reflects his priorities. He, he feels He's very proud of the budget, reflects what he believes the country ought to go, direction we ought to go. I have some concerns. One, it's the fourth trillion dollar deficit in a row, and the deficits remain at a trillion dollars for most of the century. You know, at some point, a trillion dollars almost loses value in your mind. You know, it's just so much. The way I always like to keep it in perspective is that if you and I, uh, we started a small business, an oil bit company, on the day our Lord was born, and we lose, lost a million dollars every day since, we still wouldn't meet your first trillion dollars. But we're running deficits greater than that every year. This is important. As 11 trillion bucks to, to the national debt of what we owe, and if we adopted the budget, we would have the largest federal government in America. Larger even than World War II, where we stopped everything and poured everything into winning the war, we would be a larger government, federal government, than that. Tax increases, the president feels like people ought to pay uh, their fair share. So he's added about $2 trillion in tax increases. A lot of it is on families and small businesses, higher income taxes. They, keep, they can't deduct what they give to charitable organizations as much. The mortgage deduction, capital gains, and dividends. Dividends, by the way, is one of the biggest revenues for seniors. People who've invested to get dividends, it helps, it helps uh, them with Social Security now. Death tax, number one reason small businesses and family owned uh, farms can't be passed down to their uh, kids. Uh, he proposes to increase taxes there. He proposes to double tax U.S. companies competing overseas. That's you. And about $85 billion in taxes on U.S. Uh, and U.S. producing energy companies, which is going to again drop down the number of uh, wealth being produced, cost us jobs. And what worries me, no reforms to preserve Social Security and Medicare. Those are great programs, but they're going broke, and we've got to fix them. Here's the President cuts $4 trillion to his credit, cuts $4 trillion. You can tell, look at the way we're spending that little tiny lime green portion of the corner. Is what the difference is, it's not enough. 
we have to do a lot more than that. Um, here's the tax increases you can tell the, the blue is small businesses and individuals. On energy, you know, the I, uh, American Petroleum Institute gave us this uh, chart. But if you increase oil and natural gas development, you have a million jobs, you have a bunch of revenue to the government, and you produce more energy. But if you raise those taxes, as the president proposed, it'll cost us about 50,000 jobs. We lose revenue, we lose energy production. So it, makes, it seems to me that choice is pretty clear. Uh, this is the, the president's new health care law. My committee, Joining Economic Committee, put this together. Um, these are physicians over there in that far corner of patients. There's about 159 new bureaucracies in between you and your doctor in the future. Um, we need to do health care reform, no question about it. It's too expensive, not enough people have it. I'm not sure this is the solution. In fact, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced Here, Here's our future. Right here, this is my favorite chart, not because of what it shows you, but it tells us where we've been. The green is our revenue that goes to the federal government. As you can tell over time, even with the ups and downs, it stays pretty constant. About 19% of our economy we send to Washington to pay for the federal government. The red is spent, and we are just getting going on a huge spending chart. This is what our independent Congressional Budget Office tells us our future looks like. And when our economy recovers, you know, revenue's going to come back. But it won't come back ever enough to pay for all the new spending. We could double everyone's taxes in this room. We could double everyone's taxes in America. We'd still be running a deficit. And to put that chart into family terms, which I'm always thinking about, a child born today, their share of that spending, of that debt, is about forty-seven thousand dollars. So, baby born today, the local hospital owes Uncle Sam a new Lexus. If we don't change our way by the time they're thirteen, they'll owe Uncle Sam a second Lexus. And by the time they're twenty-two and they finish college at U of H in Texas, Sam used to where we go. They'll owe Uncle Sam a third Lexus. Now, good news is young people don't actually have to buy luxury sedans for their federal government. But young people pay the price in a different way from all this spending. Because all that debt drags down an economy, just like it would drag down your family if all your money went to pay your bills or pay your uh, credit cards, your mortgage, you have nothing left. Just like you drag down a company when it's too heavy in debt, it does the same thing. So young people, when they turn 22, they're getting ready to go out and lead their lives. They'll find there are fewer jobs available to them. There'll be higher interest rates, there'll be higher taxes. So less cheese for good jobs. And they won't have as much money in the paycheck, but they do get it. So there's a real price to, to real people for all this spending now. Um, the president obviously proposed a lot of debt. We, we've got to get this under control. Democrats, Republicans have got to figure out how we get this spending under control. Um, we proposed a budget. We'll do this here in another week. It gives us a different path. It changes that curve, changes that curve, not dramatically at the beginning, but over time the goal is not just to pay down the debt, not just to balance the budget, it's to pay off the debt. Literally, pay off our debt as a <clears throat> Looking ahead, I'll finally finish with this. We've got a big tax cliff coming toward us at the end of this year, January 31st. Some, some of the tax relief that you and I already count on has expired. The state and local sales tax deduction that allows you to deduct on April 15th what you bought at the local stores. If you bought a new car, bought a new boat, whatever the sales tax is, you can take off what you send up the same. In Texas, uh, we save over a billion dollars, you and I as taxpayers. As a result, that's expired. Some of the small business uh, issues have expired. But on 30, December 31st, all the Republican tax relief, all brackets, that means every one of us in this room, everybody, all rates, go up. The alternative minimum tax explodes, which is, that was the old Buffett rule from the 1970s um, that created a second tax to capture you if you're wealthy. Now it captures middle income families. The debt tax, the payroll tax holiday I talked about, they all expire. So a bunch of other things, the college tax credits to help you 
get your kids to college, the marriage penalty comes back, the child tax credit, if you've got kids under 18, that's $1,000 a year, uh, goes away. And so we've got a big, we've got a big challenge ahead at the end of this year. Uh, this is just some of the tax issues on ways and make, ways and means that I lead on expanding the sales tax deduction, killing the debt tax, uh, all the energy taxes. My job is to block new energy taxes uh, in uh, ways and means. Um, so at the end of the day, I'll stop with this. Um, right now, there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of division in Congress right now, and it's not by party. It's because there really is two different visions of what direction we want the country to go in. Um, and people feel strong in both ways about it. But in November, <clears throat> one of the key questions that you are going to have to uh, answer at the ballot box, does the government spend too much or does it take too little of your income? Because that's going to dictate a lot of where we go in Congress. You think the problem is government spends too much or you're just not taxed. How large a government do you want? I mean, you have to pay for it. I mean, it comes out of your pocket. So how big a government do you want to come out of Washington, D.C.? And then finally, should we act now, preserve Social Security and Medicare, or do we let members of Congress just keep pushing this thing down the road? It seems to me as important as those programs are, I hope we'll, I hope we'll push to act now because we can save them. There's no question about it. We can keep those two programs going forever, <clears throat> forever, but we got to act now. So, with that, um, I'm trying to run through that as quick as I can, plus I'm getting paid by the PowerPoint slide, as you can tell. So, um, Laura, with your permission, I stop and take some questions or comments? Yeah, absolutely. It's not a, uh, not a shy group, but um, actually, Congressman, I have one that uh, I'd uh, like to kick off with. So, we have redistricting coming up right now. What's the impact on <clears throat> you in this area and in the redistricting? Um, you comment about that? Well, our district right now, the 8th district, uh, starts on the Louisiana border by an orange, goes up north to the southern part of Toledo Bend, comes across most of East Texas, comes down through Trinity, uh, Walker County, Montgomery County. That's the current district. We lose seven of those counties in East and Southeast Texas. We gain five more going toward Dallas. But Montgomery, Walker County stay, and uh, San Antonio County sort of stays the board. So we just sort of rotate uh, that direction. Which I hate losing those East Texas counties. It's a really good thing. Um, but every 10 years they change their minds. You don't have a lot of control over it, so it is what it is. I was told I was only going to get easy questions. Look at this. Thanks. <clears throat> Yes, sir. What's the chance of uh, getting those Obamacare repealed? What's the chances of it? Um, I think to get it fully repealed, you're going to have to repeal some of the lawmakers that put it in place. I mean, honestly, we've already passed it out of the House to repeal that whole big bureaucracy and replace it with a little more common sense approach. But this has been blocked in the Senate. Uh, Democratic Senate feels differently than we do. Obviously, the president feels that's his bill, so he loves it. So if we're going to change it and repeal it, it's going to be at the ballot box. The only other thing that could change that is that later this summer, the, the Supreme Court is going to take up one key portion of that bill. And that key portion, but that whole law, that whole thing, oops, um, is dependent on, is the whole premise of this is that everyone in America has to have government-approved health care or pay a fine. Everybody has to, to do that. So at the heart of that is that mandate. You've got to have government-approved health care or you pay a fine if you know. That's going to Supreme Court. Uh, they're going to hear it sort of unpressed in two or three days of, of the arguments on it. We should know something by late summer. And here's the point to you and me. The reason I, I'm hopeful the Supreme Court strikes it down uh, is that if the federal government, if Washington, 
has the power to force you to buy this product, there is no limit to the power of the federal government to force you to buy anything or do anything we as the Congress and the President choose. I don't want them or us to have that power, that much power. So we might get that key portion of that bill struck down. Maybe. I'm not a, Supreme, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a Supreme Court watcher, but there's a 50-50 chance at it. If that, is struck, if that is struck down, most of that law crumbles. That answer, what do you think? You're absolutely right. There's no way they should have the, the power to tell us what we what we can or can't do for ourselves. You were, you were right before too when you said everything's out of control as far as being able to get people in there to, to get stuff done health wise, but that's definitely not the answer. Yeah, there's a better answer this And by the way, this chart I asked my staff to go through all 2,801 pages of that law. I said, make me an organization chart. That's what came out of it. But here's what's amazing. We couldn't fit it all on one chart. That's one third of the new health care <clears throat> But that's all we could put on the chart. It, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, this is a mission Tracking the spread of COVID-19 in um, uh, my understanding is that Ed Chance, the current county commissioner, is going out for bids first on the file that goes west on 242, then his second lead will go to one going east on the file over that direction. Both of them will be told, like they are on the whole party toll road, electronic tolling, but I think he's already going out for bid on the In this intersection, as you know, I'm trying to get to it from five to seven. You know, more early in the morning is tough. So there will be a loop going west and then another loop in this area? Actually, not a loop, but a flyover. Wow. Yeah, they're going to go from I 45, so when you're returning home from going west, or eventually if you're going east, you'll be able to avoid the intersection, slide straight over, and connect on 242. Both directions, yeah. But our county commissioner has changed the report on that a lot. Yes, sir. Y'all sell it on the, uh, like the welfare and stuff, how they're using them at the strip joints and all yeah. that. Why don't they drug test those people? You know, if you're going to be on welfare, why don't you do drug testing for them? Well, there's some, uh, there's some states that have begun to do some of that, and we want to open it up on the unemployment side of it. But eventually, uh, my guess is that's going to be the case. But there's a lot of resistance in Washington right now to do it. It just seems to me, look, one, your tax dollars shouldn't be subsidizing drug use, for one. Secondly, look, if you got a problem, chances you're getting a good parent. You want to do it. Chances you getting that good job isn't good either. So we don't help people at all by subsidizing that use. What do you think? You got to take it away from the drug <laughs> that fits on a open seat, right? I'm not sure I'm putting it on there, but yeah. So, um, first of all, thank you for coming here. This I've been here 33 years. Uh, what can we do to bring more industry back as a government or people back to the U.S. so our kids and grandkids have more opportunity? Yeah. yeah, that is a great question, and the answer is we have to be as competitive as a country as you are as a company. The rest of the world has taken our playbook, low taxes, balanced regulation, great respect for small businesses and job creation. They've taken those pages and they're beating us over the head with it. And we now, here next month, <coughs> America will have the highest business tax rate in the world. Uh, in a lot of uh, a decade or two ago, we were the number one country for tax rates. We we're the number one company for research and development. Today, we are trailing a bunch of our competitors. And so, if we want companies to, to choose America first, we have to have a business climate that allows them to choose America 
first. And so that end of the year tax cliff, for example, we talked about, um, if we don't keep those taxes low, I guarantee you more businesses are going, not just choose, they'll be forced to sell or, or to, to do more overseas. My thinking is, look, we ought to have, we ought to have our goal ought to have, be that the strongest economy in the world for the next 100 years. I don't mean until China catches us. I don't mean until we stumble. Our goal for our kids and grandkids ought to be what's to take to be the number one country economy in the world for the whole century. Uh, and then we ought to make every decision based on does that help us do that or does it hurt us in that area. If we raise those taxes, we're not very bright because it's going to move us farther away from that competitive environment. Does that make sense? Can I take you to Washington with me? Because <laughs> some people don't quite get that point. Well, you're competing and winning. You're the best country with the companies in the world. You're beating them every day. We got an environment that allows you to keep beating them every day. And I understand we have so many customers around the world. You got to have, in some cases, you got to have a manufacturing plant or a distribution plant or a servicing plant near the customers. I understand that. That's competition. That's how you beat these other countries. But where we can, we got to create the environment where we can create those jobs here. It makes sense to me. Okay, right. Yes, sir. And then we'll come over here. For all to, as it also said, that all companies pay more in taxes and they have less exemption than other big business. How are we going to stop you from doing that? Well, that's on ways and means. You know, my top priority is to stop those proposed energy taxes from occurring. One, these are not subsidies, and old president calls them that. But no one writes a check to your company or to the, your customers who are energy companies. Nobody in government does it. These are tax provisions that have existed since the 1913s and 1914s. Industries are different. Different businesses are different. So parts of the tax code were designed to address this certain type of industry. In energy, because it's very capital intensive, very long term, very high risk. We have tax provisions that have been in place almost 100 years. He calls them subsidies. He wants to eliminate them. But if we do that, we are we are eliminating production and expiration in America. We're going to cost the jobs and the revenue that go with it. And companies are going to choose to do their expiration somewhere else. Because as good as we're doing right now in oil shale, companies have a lot of choices around the world where they want to produce. So it's a big mistake to raise taxes on U.S. American-made energy. It makes no sense. And one of his provisions, I'll tell you, actually drives me crazy. One of them says, we did this waste means to me in 2004, worried about the number of jobs being shipped offshore. We changed the tax code. We said, look, if you manufacture, if you produce, if you invent here in America, you have a lower tax rate than if you do that somewhere else. So if you do it around the world, you pay higher taxes to do that. It makes sense. Keep the jobs here. The president says, well, that's true, except for one industry, American energy. So American energy would be taxed for the jobs they create here, the manufacturing, production, the invention they do in America. They'd be taxed like they were doing it in some other country. That makes no sense. All you're going to do is drive those jobs those other countries. So one of my top priorities on ways and means, a number of foreign seniority there, and the top, Sam Johnson and I from Texas, our jobs to stop those energy taxes because it's going to hurt us. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. I have two teenage daughters, and what are the ones who can more school teachers in the program that are reaching out to children? Yeah, I'll tell you, um, it's a concern because good teachers make all the difference in the world. It's getting harder in the classroom for them there. 
expect it to solve every problem in the world. You know, not just teaching, you know, the basics, but every problem. We don't have a lot to do with that from, from the federal level. In fact, we're about 10% of most school districts' budget, and that's normal in uh, special needs kids, help, help them, and for those loose lunches, that's really what the federal government does. Local pay is determined by the local school board, and <coughs> somewhat, <coughs> excuse me, somewhat at the same level, but mainly at the local level. Here, I don't know which school district you're in, but I did notice in Conroe School District that they're giving a $1,600 teacher pay raise this year without raising taxes and makes some cuts somewhere else. I think that helps us stay competitive with other districts, hopefully, helps keep some good teachers around. What do you think? What do you think ought to be done? Are they for bed? So I go up, I get to go up to um, 
the Legion of Modern Trinity a uh, summer or so ago. And uh, among his friends, his veterans, his family, the community, to present him the Purple Heart he earned uh, at Saipan. And when he talks, he tells us, the rest of us in awe of him. And Billy Trio says, no, I'm not a hero. This is just what Americans do for us. At the same time I meet Billy Trio, I'm meeting Sergeant Andy Wright from Willis. You may have read about him, 2004 rocket propelled grenade. It's his uh, vehicle um, that blows off both his arms, uh, tears a hole in his left leg. He's bleeding out, still calls him help for his unit. They all survive. He decides not to be a victim. He, he becomes, even with his disability, a hand to hand combat instructor for the Marines. He's now out of it, but a year or so ago, the community came together um, in Montgomery County, South County here, in a small room. Uh, reception area, they raised the last $80,000 to build a home adapted to Eddie's disabilities. And he takes the microphone to say thanks. And in his remarks, he says, from time to time, people ask, you know, if you could go back that day, you know, if you could avoid that injury, if you had to have your arms back, your life back, maybe that would be great. And he said, my answer is, always oh, is, absolutely not. I wouldn't change anything. He said, I, I've learned so much about American people, so so thankful, so generous, so appreciative. He said, I now know more about the freedoms I was fighting for than when I was fighting for. The reason I always like to end with Billy and Trio and Eddie Wright is that, well, you know, if, you, if you're looking for the greatness of America and the size of its government, you'll always be this. You look for the greatness of America and its people and our veterans and our community, You'll never be this. We need to stop looking to Washington for all the solutions. We just need to be looking with you. We need to look in the communities, in the families, in the businesses. That's where the solutions are. If we do more of that, we're going to be fine as a country. We'll be the number one economy for another hundred years or so. Look, thank you very much for having me here today. This is Session Press Facility. God bless. Thanks.